to get started. So um, my name is Jenny Colbertson. I'm the director of the Center of Language Evolution um, here in Edinburgh. And uh, welcome to all of you, those in the room and those of us, those of you joining us virtually to the 2022 Edinburgh Lectures on Language Evolution. So I'm really pleased to have you all here with us and really excited about our lineup of speakers this year. Um, so obviously you are here to see Ev Fedorenko, um, but we have a fantastic um, complete lineup of speakers. So please do come and join us for um, Tom Griffiths next Thursday the 9th. Um, Tecumseh Fitch uh, the following Thursday, the, six, the 16th, and Asfa Majid, who will be on the 23rd. If you're local to Edinburgh, please do come and join us for the in-person reception that will happen after um, Asfa Majid's talk, and that is co-sponsored by the UKRI Center for Doctoral Training in NLP, so do come, do come along to that. So um, before we get going, a couple of things. So first, I just want to thank our student organizers. Um, this series would not have been possible without them. So that's Ashleen Kyo, um, um, Henry Conklin, and Elizabeth Pankratz. And I'm going to uh, hand it off to Elizabeth in just one minute to introduce our speaker. But just to let you know, um, we'll be taking audience questions after the talk. So we'll have a panel discussion. Um, but if anyone in the audience would like to ask a question, please do. But if you can use the Q&A rather than the chat, um, that would be fantastic. And have a look at the Q&A and upvote any questions that you'd like to hear the answer to. And without further ado, I pass it over to Elizabeth. All right. So hi, I'm Elizabeth. I'm a first year PhD student here at the Center for Language Evolution in Edinburgh. And uh, I'm introducing Ev Fedorenko. She's a cognitive neuroscientist and associate professor of neuroscience at MIT, where she leads a lab that does research on how different brain regions play a role in linguistic processing and comprehension. Um, one of the things that she's well known for is the contribution of developing a new fMRI-based method for functionally localizing brain regions that are relevant for linguistic processing. Um, and so these are issues the ones that she and her lab take on that are of interest really for all of us in understanding the emergence of language in humans. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Ev and her talk on the language system in the human mind and brain. So Ev, the screen is yours. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so let me um, do this right. Um, looks okay? Looks Anybody great. Can you hear me? Yep. You okay. can. Great. Um, so uh, two disclaimers before I start. One is that, um, <clears throat> well, I guess I'll start with the second one. I'm a little bit sick, so I'm sorry if coughing ensues um, at some point. Um, I'll, I'll try to control that. Um, and the second is that in the interest of kind of covering a lot of conceptual and empirical ground, uh, the talk is at a pretty high level. So with a few exceptions, I won't go into details of um, uh, any data I talk about, but all of the work I'm presenting today is uh, published stuff, so you can find um, details in those papers. And happy to answer questions in the uh, discussion, of course. Okay, so thanks very much for uh, inviting me. This is um, an exciting um, uh, topic, language evolution, of course, for many people. Um, I wanna start by thanking um, a lot of incredible people who have done this work with me, starting from my uh, mentors, Ted Gibson and Skemusher, um, to all of the labbies um, that have um, um, worked with over the years. Um, so I wanna start with something uh, non-controversial, uh, which is that there are some differences between humans and um, our uh, primate relatives, even the close ones. Um, so on the cognitive side, these differences include the fact that humans are smarter, they can solve more complex problems, um, and they also have language. However, the relationship between these two aspects of cognition is, of course, uh, long ridden with controversy. Did language makes us, make us smart uh, by enabling us to think in certain ways inaccessible to other animals? Um, or is lang language simply reflecting our independently sophisticated linguistic abilities and perhaps is um, their consequence? Um, Ray Jack ended up with this uh, beautifully in, a, um, in his 96 book. Um, he wrote, uh, it is a widespread platitude that we differ from other animals in being smarter and being able to think or reason better. It is another widespread platitude that we differ from other animals in having language. Hence, it is not surprising to draw some connection between the two. 
the connection between language and thought seems altogether obvious. Of course, language helps us think, but how much of our increased reasoning power is specifically due to language? And he then proceeds to argue that um, it's not very much. And I'm going to be making a, a similar point today. Okay, so these questions, of course, are at the very heart of uh, uh, language evolution debates. Um, why did language emerge in our species? Did it come about to enable us to think more complex thoughts? Or did it instead emerge um, so we could share those thoughts with um, each other? Um, in other words, maybe we got smarter and this increase in intelligence called for a more sophisticated communication system. Um, like, for example, linguistic communication presumably facilitated uh, cooperative behaviors um, and or passing uh, important knowledge to offspring, both of which could increase um, evolutionary fitness. Like I said, I'm going to be arguing against the idea that language evolved for thinking complex thoughts. And just so that it's um, clear that I'm not arguing against a straw man, I want to remind you that many smart people over the long history of um, human like, philosophy and science have, um, admittedly, these arguments have been more on the side of philosophy than science, I have advocated this language for thought view. So um, one of the strongest proponents of this idea in recent history is Noam Chomsky, um, who writes, uh, the systems of thought use linguistic expressions for reasoning, interpretation, organizing action and other mental acts. Um, and this idea has also been advocated by uh, famously Wittgenstein, uh, who wrote the limits of my language mean the limits of my world. Um, and Chomsky also explicitly argued for many years and to this date um, against the communicative function of language. So he writes, uh, almost all of your use of language is internal. Virtually all of the use of language has nothing to do with communication. The idea that language has evolved as a system of communication or designed for communication makes no sense. But of course, these are um, words, and um, I personally prefer to um, draw on uh, empirical data. So um, let's do that. Um, so what I want to do today is um, I'll start by just introducing the language network and the brain, the system I'll be talking about. I will then tell you three things about um, the language system that suggests that it does not, and in fact, could not support complex thought and reasoning. And if it's not clear why these three things matter for this argument, it will become um, clear later, I hope. Um, I will then show you that the system that is linked with our reasoning abilities does not even play a role in language processing. Um, and finally, I will briefly discuss some links between the language system and our social cognitive mechanisms, which potentially could be used uh, in favor of the idea that language evolved for communication with conspecifics. And time permitting, I'll make some final remarks. Okay, so um, we have long known that um, there's a set of areas in our brain uh, in the left hemisphere and in most individuals that are important for language. Uh, using brain imaging approaches like functional MRI, you can find these regions in just a few minutes of scanning um, by contrasting responses to a linguistic stimulus like uh, reading or listening to sentences um, co uh, compared to some stimuli that are perceptually similar but lack meaning and structure, so sequences of non-words or um, uh, speech in a foreign language or something like that. Um, and these brain areas exhibit a few important properties. So they respond um, robustly when we understand language, uh, spoken, signed, or uh, written. Um, they also respond during language production, also across modalities. These two um, properties together suggest um, that it's quite likely that this is a system that stores our language knowledge representations, which of course you can use to both um, uh, decode um, meaning from others' utterances, as well as encode your own thoughts into sequences of words. These regions appear to be um, uh, topographically and functionally similar across uh, typologically diverse languages. So um, we've now tested this in around 50 languages across um, 12 language families and found that not just the basic spatial um, layout is similar, but also uh, key functional signatures appear to hold across speakers of these diverse languages. <laughs> The regions of this network also form a functionally integrated system with strong anatomical connections and a high degree of um, functional synchronization in activity, suggesting that they, these regions work together in the service of a, a, a common goal. And this strong um, uh, interregional synchronization uh, makes it also possible to find the system in a completely data-driven um, manner without any test contrast. So you can kind of 
um, look across the brain and find this subset of voxels that uh, synchronize together um, during paradigms like naturalistic cognition. So resting state, just lying in the scanner doing nothing or watching a movie or something like this. Um, so this system is a robust um, natural kind. And of course, these regions are causally important for language so that um, uh, an abrupt um, damage to these regions in adulthood uh, will lead to problems in comprehension production or uh, both. Okay, um, another important point before I uh, move on to the next section is um, that uh, the precise locations uh, of these language areas vary across individuals. So a point that Elizabeth alluded to um, when introducing me. Um, so here are just uh, six sample individual maps uh, of the language system. And you can see that broadly, these regions look kind of similar, right? There's always some lateral frontal and lateral temporal activity, but the precise locations, shapes and sizes of these um, uh, regions vary quite a bit. Um, and uh, because of this variability, uh, I've argued that uh, identifying these regions and in, uh, individuals is critical for drawing um, meaningful uh, inferences. Um, this approach also makes it quite a bit easier to establish a cumulative research enterprise where uh, we're more confident that we're referring to the same um, regions in the brain uh, across individual studies and labs. Uh, this uh, individual localization may not always be possible, and also in an effort to connect to um, the past literature that has used group averaging approaches, uh, we also developed uh, a probabilistic language atlas based on um, uh, over 800 individuals that were scanned on this language localizer paradigm in the last decade. Um, and this atlas can be basically used to estimate for any location in a um, template space like the MNI space or the FS average space, uh, the probability that it falls within the language system. So we're kind of trying to create a universal frame of reference uh, for the language system. Okay, so now I'll move to the part of the talk where I present you um, with some evidence uh, against the language system supporting complex thought. So let's start by uh, considering the spectrum of abilities that uh, humans have. Um, aside from our perceptual intelligence, um, supporting our ability to recognize uh, objects, um, voices, faces, and so on, and our motor intelligence, uh, supporting our ability to physically interact uh, with the world, um, we can do all sorts of things. Some of these um, uh, are similar to things other animals can do. Some of them are specific to us. Uh, we can do things like solve math problems um, or logic puzzles. Uh, very evolutionary new skills uh, that are becoming increasingly important in our um, culture uh, is computer coding, so interacting with machines by a particular kind of um, uh, language. We can create and appreciate uh, music. Um, we possess a host of executive abilities like attention, uh, inhibitory control, working memory, as well as planning and decision making. Um, and using these uh, kinds of abilities, we can solve totally new problems on uh, even highly abstract stimuli. We can interact cooperatively with um, conspecifics, uh, jointly solve problems. Um, we can figure out what somebody else thinks or feels and resolve conflicts locally and at the societal scale. Um, and of course, we have a very rich knowledge of the world, of the kind of objects um, that exist, uh, the kinds of events that can um, happen and uh, physical properties of the world like gravity uh, and kind of boundaries on realities, things that can versus cannot happen in real life. So what is the relationship between language, um, the language system and all of these other abilities? So to probe um, uh, this relationship, there's two methods that have been historically used and are still kind of the best tools we have. Um, one is functional MRI, um, where you can look for overlap in activity, and another one is patient investigation. So I'll start with um, evidence from um, fMRI. Uh, and I'll present you data that are now kind of pooled from across um, over 30 experiments. Um, that we've conducted over the years, looking for uh, overlap between language and diverse perceptual motor and cognitive abilities. Um, to do this in all of these experiments, the setup is bas basically the same. So we do our language localizer task that finds um, in that each individual their language system. And then we ask, do these regions that work hard when you process language 
also work hard when you listen to music or when you solve a math problem or when you're thinking about somebody's emotions or something like that. And um, uh, here are the responses uh, to the sentence comprehension condition in dark gray uh, and our control condition like uh, reading or listening to non-words in uh, a lighter gray. And everything zero here is a fixation baseline, so just kind of a um, brain during rest. Um, and in different colors, I'll show you responses to these different non-linguistic stimuli and tasks, spanning a wide range of um, cognitive abilities, including those linked to complex reasoning. So I tried to kind of group them here by um, uh, into categories by color. So we have uh, visual conditions in yellow, so crossing a wide range of um, visual stimuli, including social ones like faces, uh, auditory conditions with the lighter set of um, seven bars responding to listening to different kinds of music. Um, hand and uh, face motor control uh, in red, um, numerical cognition, so solving math problems in pink, uh, reading computer code in purple, executive functions like working, pretty demanding working memory tasks, inhibitory control tasks, and so on. Uh, categorization tasks, so for example, deciding if an object belongs to a class of animals or something. Um, and then finally, visual event comprehension. So events um, are presented in pictures or uh, videos without um, language. And as you can see, these brain areas that work um, really hard when you process um, uh, linguistic information work about as hard when you're solving a math problem or hold information in working memory or listen to a piece of music as they do when you're lying there in silence with no uh, stimuli at all. And I should say that this is um, uh, showing this across the five areas of the language system, but the response is similar in each of the regions individually, including this region and in the um, inferior frontal cortex around so-called Broca's area. Um, if we draw a line from our control condition, um, which is this uh, processing of non-word stimuli like Blicket, uh, the only conditions that elicit a response above it are these visual meaningful events, the set of green bars on the right. The response is still much lower than um, that elicited by sentences. And as I'll tell you in a second, patients with severe language damage don't seem to have issues with visual event semantics, suggesting that this response is not functionally critical. Uh, and it's also important to know that all of these 64 non-linguistic conditions, of course, elicit strong responses elsewhere in the brain. Uh, it just happens to be in regions that are non-overlapping with the language areas. Okay, so a complementary approach um, to addressing the question of whether language shares machinery with other mental functions is looking at cognitive abilities in individuals who lack a properly functioning language system due to aphasia. And most telling cases are cases of so-called global aphasia, which results from um, uh, severe damage to the language system, typically due to a large um, stroke. So here are brains of three such patients, and you can kind of appreciate that basically the whole perisylvian cortex, or so lateral frontal, lateral temporal cortex, is um, missing. And this damage leads to really profound deficits in producing and understanding language. At best, you have sparing of single word comprehension for very common, very frequent uh, concrete words. Um, this group has been studied uh, over the last um, couple of decades now by Rosemary Varley at UCL, um, including um, some work that we've done collaboratively. Uh, and over the last many years, she's looked basically at a whole range of um, cognitive abilities, asking, okay, these individuals who basically lost their language system, they no longer have access to linguistic representations, can they still um, do math? Can they lo logically reason? Can they understand somebody's emotional states? And strikingly, it turns out that in spite of these really severe language problems, pretty much everything that she's looked at um, seems to work just fine, including um, you know, this kind of formal reasoning, math, logic, um, appreciating structure in music, um, holding information in memory, social emotional intelligence. And um, the point I mentioned is they seem to have a very rich unimpaired understanding of the world so they can make complex judgments about visual events, suggesting that at least that information must be redundantly represented somewhere else, even if the language system shows some response to these stimuli as well. Okay, um, so the only system, the only thing that these patients lack is the ability to convert their thoughts into a verbal format and to extract meaningful information from others' uh, linguistic productions. 
and um, this kind of um, uh, preserved um, cognition in the absence of language is aligning well with the kind of selectivity I was just showing you based on um, fMRI findings. A couple of important points uh, to note here. Um, one is that uh, specialization does not entail innateness. Uh, we know that specialization can and does um, arise as a function of experience in the world. Uh, the best example is perhaps a region in the, uh, that emerges in the visual cortex when kids learn to read, which becomes highly selective for uh, letters, letter strings. Um, and the way that I've been talking about this language system as kind of a store of our linguistic knowledge representation that can then be used to encode and decode between thought and this code that we share with other um, humans um, makes it clear that I think that the system um, arises experientially. So basically, we come into the world, we start learning um, word meanings, uh, meanings of constructions, and that knowledge has to be stored somewhere. And I think this system is a plausible place um, for this knowledge to be stored. Um, and second, um, here I talked about the separation between language and thought in uh, adult fully formed brains. Um, you may ask, uh, could language be critical for the development of thought, at least some aspects of thought? Um, and the answer is maybe, but apparently in quite a limited way. So the best evidence we have here comes from uh, deaf kids who are born to hearing parents, which is the majority of deaf kids. Uh, and in some cases, um, especially in the past, um, when deaf education was um, not um, very good, uh, kids in such families would often not get access to language because their parents wouldn't know sign language because they wouldn't have had a reason typically to uh, acquire it, to learn it, um, and uh, nobody else was signing, would sign to them. And in some cases, kids grew up like that, perfectly loved with all the stimulation that kids get um, regularly, just not getting linguistic input. And you can ask, do these kids develop normally, right? Do they learn to think like we do? And definitely more work is needed there. Uh, mostly this is based on kind of sparse studies here and there and anecdotal reports. But, um, oh, and sometimes this lack of language lasts like into the teenage years. At least there used to be cases like that. Now it's, I think it's, um, at least in the US, um, uh, it doesn't happen very often, which is uh, good. Um, but it seems that with the exception of some aspects of theory of mind, most other things you can learn absent language. You can learn to do math, you can learn to reason about all sorts of sophisticated causal chains. So it seems that linguistic um, representations are not a prerequisite for um, these things. Not that it wouldn't make it easier. Of course, if I can tell you how to do something or you know how to, um, what I'm thinking, like you can very, that's a very good source of information, but it seems that it's not a critical prerequisite. Okay, so now on to um, another property of um, language that I think make it uh, makes it um, makes a good case for why uh, um, the language system doesn't mediate thought, uh, and it is that language does not rely on abstract syntax. So what does it mean, and how does this argument go? So let's uh, work through it. So here's a figure um, adapted uh, from a 2013 text review by Berwick and colleagues. Um, language, this uh, blue box here, is proposed to connect to an external um, sensory motor interface in red. So these are kind of your perceptual and motor components of language, which I, I haven't talked about much today, but they're separate from the system I'm talking about. They're basically the inputs and outputs of the system I'm um, focusing on. Uh, and it also connects to this, what they call an internal conceptual intentional interface in orange. So this is effectively thought broadly construed. So, so far, so good. Now, in this theoretical tradition, um, which has advocated the language as a tool for thought view, language is proposed to consist of syntactic rules and representations, um, which in sometime in the 90s got reduced to um, a single combinatorial operation called merge, uh, defined in this paper and elsewhere as basically an operation that uh, constructs new representational elements from already constructed elements, right? So it just takes two things and bites them into a new complex representation. So here's the critical bit. Oh, and so, yeah, so here's the critical bit. So this operation is purported to have emerged in humans and the argument is this operation enabled greater complexity in the internal conceptual intentional interface, effectively allowing for more complex thoughts. And you can read more about this reasoning in Berwick and Chomsky's book, Why Only Us. Um, and you can also read um, 
Cedric uh, Brooks' uh, critique of that book, um, if you're interested. So uh, now for this argument to work, this combinatorial operation has to be incredibly uh, it has to be highly abstract, right? So that it doesn't care much about the nature of what's being combined. It can be an adjective and a noun to form a uh, noun, complex noun phrase, or it can be two propositions as in a case of constructing a complex argument. Um, however, the abstractness of syntax and natural language has long been questioned in linguistics, um, psycholinguistics, language development, neuroscience, and natural language processing. Um, I won't go through the evidence in the interest of time. Some of it is summarized um, in a recent um, cognition paper, but I'll tell you briefly two things that we've learned about um, syntactic processing in the brain. So one is that um, the notion, so the notion of abstract syntactic processing has um, often been linked with the idea of syntactic hubs. It doesn't logically have to be, but it just so happens that um, people who have argued for abstract um, uh, combinatorial processing have often argued that a part of the language system uh, carries out um, syntactic processing. Uh, but it doesn't seem that there are such regions. Um, instead, syntactic processing appears to be distributed across the entire um, language network, um, as evidenced by both uh, brain imaging work and uh, patient work uh, from aphasia. Uh, and second, and critically, we don't see any neural signatures that are consistent with abstract structure building operations. Um, when I talked about language specificity, I already mentioned the fact that any neural unit that shows sensitivity to linguistic processing, including structural processing, does not respond to structure building in other domains like math or music or action planning. Um, and um, now I wanna tell you that even within the domain of language, any brain area or cell population that is sensitive to um, uh, structure is also deeply sensitive to word meanings. So there is nothing that responds, um, whose response is consistent with uh, just being engaged in kind of abstract combinatorics. Sometimes when I talk about um, uh, these arguments, people kind of infer that I'm saying something about the language system not caring about syntax, and that's absolutely not true. The system is very deeply sensitive to syntactic structure. We and many others have established sensitivity um, to a host of um, structural manipulations from um, like stronger responses to structure than unstructured stimuli, so stronger responses to phrases than unconnected lists of words, uh, sensitivity to syntactic surprisal, um, or sensitivity to costs of non-local dependencies in language, um, adaptation to syntactic structure, so low responses to repeated structure. Um, the critical point here is that every neural unit within the language system, be it the brain area, voxel, so anywhere within the system, or cell population, as you can probe with intracranial recordings, um, will respond to both uh, combinatorial structure but also to meanings of individual words. So for example, responding more strongly to table than blork or contributing in multivariate ways to meaning representation um, of uh, words. And um, if um, a unit responds more to table than blork um, or otherwise contributes to word meaning representations, I just don't see how it could be implementing something as abstract as merge is uh, argued to be. And so this is, of course, um, this kind of um, uh, idea of strong integration between word meanings and combinatorial processing is aligned with um, like construction grammar approaches and other usage-based approaches to language where there is no sharp separation between um, uh, syntax and um, word meanings. Okay, so finally, a third property of language that I'll mention today, um, namely the size of the language systems temporal receptive window, abbreviated here as TRW. Um, and the notion of temporal receptive windows um, is growing in popularity in neuroscience and is now proposed as one kind of organizing principle uh, of the brain. Uh, if you're not familiar, uh, it's basically a temporal analog of spatial receptive fields in the visual cortex, where the size of how much of the visual field is processed by cells increases from the areas at the very back of your head, primary visual cortex, to higher level visual areas on the ventral temporal surface. Um, and um, the temporal receptive window of a cell or a brain area is basically how much of the preceding context affects the processing of the current stimulus. So why does this property matter for the question of whether or not language mediates complex thought? 
Well, complex thoughts um, typically involve relating different propositions to one another. So naturally requires integration of information across quite extended temporal contexts. And yet the language system appears to have a rather short temporal receptive window, which makes it, I think, incompatible with supporting complex thought and reasoning. So let me tell you a little more about that. So we've long known um, that the language system is just not sensitive to structure at the level of discourse. Um, this is kind of classic studies in the 90s when brain imaging came about. Uh, a few groups have looked at contrast between passages or short texts and sets of unconnected sentences to see where which regions work hard to basically connect sentences into a coherent whole. And the regions that people have reported all fell outside of the kind of classical language areas. If you look specifically within the language areas, um, and we've now seen this across many different paradigms and materials, you find that there's just um, no sensitivity whatsoever. This is just in five different regions, uh, the, all the core regions of the language system. They respond equally strongly to passages and um, lists of unconnected sentences. Now, this is in very sharp contrast to a much stronger response to sentences compared to lists of unconnected words. That effect is very robust, very consistent every time um, we've tried that it, it works uh, across languages and materials and so on. So the system is very sensitive to structure within sentences roughly, but not so much at the level of um, uh, discourse. Um, right, and so from this, we know that the temporal receptive window of the language system is somewhere between a word and um, uh, a sentence. And several uh, uh, strands of evidence where we tried to manipulate this in a fine, uh, fine grain manner um, suggest that uh, the integration window of the language system is somewhere between uh, six and 10 words. Um, it, words is probably not the right unit, it's probably bits. Uh, languages package information into words in very different ways, but uh, it's a useful operationalization. Um, we're now actually looking at this across uh, typologically diverse languages to see if it may be uh, a universal constraint. Um, the short temporal receptive window, of course, of the language system fits well with evidence um, of cross-linguistic uh, ten tendencies to minimize dependency links. So most dependencies in language are actually quite local. Uh, this links also roughly corresponds to um, average length of clauses, uh, which in turn may correspond to events in the world, which is a useful unit of our um, experience. Um, and just this amount of context may provide enough linguistic context for you to successfully be able to predict upcoming words um, in the input. Now, of course, we have mechanisms in our brains that keep track of information over longer scales. Uh, for example, a system known as the default network appears to have quite long integration windows for both stories and nonverbal stimuli like movies. So the system is now a non-linguistic system. It cares about all sorts of meaningful stimuli. Uh, it's been linked to um, episodic projection. So imagining yourself in the past or future. Uh, and given these long temporal receptive windows, um, it's likely that the system is a system where we kind of construct situation models as we process complex event structures in stories or videos. Uh, and of course, the language system has to interface with this network. And I think this system is one downstream target of the language system. But critically, the language system itself appears to only keep track of relatively short preceding contacts, after which it presumably converts the est like estimated representations of meaning into some more abstract format passing them down to uh, regions that will actually engage in, for example, reasoning on those representations. But the short, um, uh, this window of a few words long, suggests that it's the language system is not the system that um, supports complex thought itself. Okay, so now I wanna look at the flip side of this question. So, um, so far I've argued that the language system, the system here does not support complex thought, but maybe the system that we know supports complex thought still can critically contribute to language processing in spite of, in spite of not being specialized for it. So the system that's long been linked to complex thinking and planning is the so-called multiple demand system or uh, MD system. Um, it's known by many names in the literature, multiple demand is the term uh, from uh, John Duncan, uh, who's um, done uh, a huge amount of work on this um, 
uh, network. Uh, and this network uh, lies bilaterally in frontal and uh, parietal cortex, and it exhibits some of the following properties. So these regions um, respond strongly when we engage uh, in diverse demanding tasks, and the response is modulated by effort. So the harder the task, the more active the system. These regions support um, goal-directed behaviors, um, and activity in these regions is linked to notions like working memory, uh, inhibitory control, um, attention, um, planning, and so on. Uh, and these are the regions that are also linked, uh, including causally, to fluid intelligence. So damage to parts of this network will lead to a loss of IQ points. Now, there is a long tradition in psycholinguistics and cognitive neuroscience to describe uh, both lexical access and syntactic and semantic parsing using domain general cognitive constructs, um, like storing information in working memory or retrieving it from working memory, updating focal attention, inhibiting irrelevant meanings or parses, um, predictive processing, and so on. And so the core question in this part of the talk is whether these kinds of mental operations um, are implemented in the language specific frontotemporal cortex or in these domain general circuits of the frontoparietal executive um, control network, multiple demand network. In other words, do we have an architecture that looks something like the following, uh, where we have a few domain general hubs here in these rectangles at the bottom, um, which implement operations like attentional selection or hierarchical structure building that are relevant for all sorts of domains, including language, but also music, social cognition, and so on. And then all these domains share, um, all draw on the same uh, region to uh, perform these operations. For those of you who may be familiar with the literature on the relationship between um, language and music, uh, Ani Patel's um, shared integration resource hypothesis is of that flavor. So he says, okay, maybe language and music have distinct knowledge representations, but when you process both, you have to draw on some shared um, resource that supports kind of structure building across um, any kind of structured stimulus. So um, let me tell you um, why this is not how it works. Um, so first to reiterate, um, the language and the multiple demand networks are distinct networks. Um, they have distinct functional profiles. I already showed you earlier that the language areas don't respond when we engage in demanding executive control tasks. Um, one point maybe worth mentioning here is that subsets of these networks um, lie very closely to each other within um, a region uh, a broca's area i don't like that term that's why i put it in scare quotes but it's in the inferior frontal cortex and i think that has led to a lot of um, confusion and to some different conclusions uh, by some past researchers compared to the story i'm telling here um, but these systems are also dissociable and brain disorders um, they show distinct patterns of both signal fluctuations so if you remember i was talking how the language system is internally very synchronized so different language regions go up and down together um, the regions of the multiple demand network also go together with each other, but if you look at a language region and a multiple demand region, there is zero uh, correlation in um, how their time courses uh, uh, unfold over um, these naturalistic cognition paradigms. They also have, whoops, uh, they also have distinct um, uh, developmental trajectories. Uh, our executive abilities develop slowly and don't um, uh, reach maturity until we're in our like late teens or early twenties, but linguistic abilities, of course, are pretty much in place by age four or so. Um, so let me tell you about the evidence that this network doesn't participate in language processing. So, okay, first, um, I mentioned to you that one key functional signature of the language system is a stronger response to um, meaningful and structured sequences like sentences, stimuli like sentences, compared to lists of unconnected words. Do MD regions show a similar preference for sentences over um, lists of words? They do not. Um, I'll show you here data from a, a recent kind of meta-analytic investigation of data in our lab. So this is taking 30 experiments, language experiments that we've run that included both um, sentences and lists of words um, uh, and looking at the language and MD regions responses to these conditions. So if we first, and now here, each bar is just um, a single experimental condition um, and ignore the colors here. It doesn't matter for the purposes of this point. The sentence bars are um, 
um, the first set and the word list conditions are um, the second set. And the language system, as I already told you, um, shows a stronger response to sentences and word lists. That's um, to be expected given uh, what we've seen in many uh, prior studies. Um, but in the multiple demand uh, network, we actually find the opposite pattern where word lists elicit a stronger response than sentences. Um, and I think this results puts into question the role of the MD network and any combinatorial linguistic operations that relate to parsing or um, semantic composition, because of course you would expect a brain region that supports such operations to respond more strongly when they have to process stimuli that require those operations compared to ones that um, do not. Uh, furthermore, across a series of studies, um, we showed that language but not uh, multiple demand regions show close stimulus tracking, so modulation of neural activity by stimulus properties. Uh, sensitivity to uh, linguistic surprisal and um, uh, working memory demands in language. So, for example, integration cost as construed in um, Ted Gibson dependency locality theory. Um, and they're modulated by language comprehension difficulty as empirically measured with, say, self paced reading times or um, uh, eye tracking times. And finally, using the same meta analytic approach I was just, uh, I just introduced to you where we pull data from across several um, diverse language comprehension experiments, um, we examine sensitivity to task demands in the language versus the multiple demand network. So if a brain region supports some linguistic computation, a computation that has to be engaged to extract a meaningful representation from language, that brain region should be active regardless of whether we're processing language passively or whether language is accompanied by some additional task, like answering a question about a sentence or something like, you know, whatever, a memory probe or something, making a judgment and so on. Um, so now the condition bars um, uh, are grouped by whether they involve passive language processing, so just passively reading or listening. Uh, these are warm colored bars. Uh, versus whether um, a language processing task is accompanied by another um, uh, another additional task. And the language system responds strongly to both. If anything, there is um, slightly higher response during the passive processing conditions. But uh, in the multiple demand uh, system, uh, when there is no secondary task to perform on the language stimuli, the response is effectively at zero. Uh, and only conditions that involve these extraneous task demands above and beyond simply extracting meaning from language, um, you get some positive um, uh, response. So based on this um, evidence I reviewed here, um, I would conclude that the language and not the multiple demand network supports core computations that relate to linguistic interpretation. And the MD network's engagement during language processing likely, likely reflects um, these artificial task demands rather than having to do with the processing of linguistic stimuli. So it appears that the architecture that we have in our brains doesn't look like this. Um, instead, it appears that the computations like attentional selection or hierarchical structure building um, are implemented locally within the language network. Um, so in the very same region that store our language knowledge representations, and presumably a similar thing happens in other domains. Um, and the reason for this has likely to do with computational metabolic efficiency that's afforded by uh, local implementation. Um, Corey Shane and I have a um, recent review of this work um, for those of you who may be interested. And I should say that in general, um, arguments are accumulating against um, the distinction between memory and computation in the brain. And um, for, for memory being an active participant in neural computation. These arguments come from both um, what we know from neurobiology, such as we don't have separate cells that store information versus process information, as well as what um, has been learned from um, um, computer science about efficient computation, which is that memory allows reusing past computations through memoization, um, where basically you can store results of uh, function calls um, that you can uh, retrieve whole when similar input uh, occurs. And that's much more efficient than always computing everything um, on the fly. But the point is basically that it doesn't seem like there is separation between um, uh, areas that store information and areas that process information. It seems that the very same um, units do both. Okay, 
so now um, a few words about um, the relationship between language and social cognition. First, um, we know that natural languages are highly efficient for information transfer. There is now ample evidence from um, um, all sorts of languages uh, showing that natural languages are shaped by communicative pressures at many levels from their sound systems to their lexica to their grammars, um, leading to a linguistic code that is on average short, which makes it easy to produce. Uh, and contextually disambiguated and redundant, which makes it easy to understand and uh, robust to noise. If language evolved for internal thought, it is not clear why it would exhibit such um, characteristics. Uh, some of this work is summarized in a recent uh, text paper by uh, Ted Gibson and colleagues. Um, and of course, it's no accident that this talk series is hosted um, at the University of Edinburgh, where some um, really transformative work has been done by Simon Kirby, Kenny Smith, um, Jenny Culbertson, and uh, many others over the years, uh, showing that uh, in um, iterated learning paradigms, uh, many key properties of natural languages emerge um, under communicative uh, pressures. More generally, there is um, lots of evidence, um, and it keeps growing, for really deep links between language and social perception and cognition. I'm only giving you like a few snippets here. This is a huge literature, actually many literatures across uh, fields. But uh, just to mention a few points, um, first, almost a truism. Uh, language and mentalizing are strongly linked in everyday use. Um, we have to engage in mentalizing to understand what people mean, right? Most of the linguistic meaning goes beyond the meaning of the literal string of words. And of course, language is also the best source of information for us to learn about what other people um, believe, think, and feel, feel, and for us to share those um, thoughts and feelings with others. Um, in terms of uh, neural machinery, language areas and areas that support social perception cognition are um, nearby. And the reason that that's important is that sometimes when you find um, uh, two functionally distinct areas right next to each other, uh, some have argued that this is uh, evidence of a proto system that was shared between the two with a later separation. And so this may provide important clues into um, potentially language evolving from some general social abilities. Um, Language and social deficits are separable, but they do go together in some developmental brain disorders like autism and Williams syndrome, for example. Um, and although just like the language and the multiple demand system, the language and social system are dissociable in their patterns of um, both signal fluctuations over time, there is also some degree of internetwork synchronization, um, which um, uh, may uh, reflect their frequent uh, co-engagement. Uh, and finally, uh, language and social cognition have similar developmental trajectories, um, and both of these abilities continue to improve throughout our lives, uh, very much unlike um, uh, fluid intelligence supported by the MD system, which very sadly peaks in the 20s, and then it just kind of um, downhill from there. Uh, but language and social cognition, we keep getting socially wiser and we keep um, um, getting better at language comprehension. So although none of these uh, pieces of evidence can conclusively tell us that language emerged for communication, these kind of evolutionary claims are hard to make. I would say that the communicative story of language evolution um, seems to align much better uh, with the available evidence, given the very sharp separation between language and um, formal thought and reasoning abilities, and on the one hand, and deep links between language and um, social cognitive capacities. Okay, so in the last few minutes, um, I'm just going to speculate a little bit not really speculators and kind of highlight some directions um, that I think are exciting and that I hope to see um, grow and uh, develop further uh, in the field. So there's still many things that we don't understand about how language works. Um, and we're quite limited, of course, by the tools um, that we have available for probing the language system or human brains in general. So I just wanna make a few suggestions for um, promising things to do so. Um, First, I think um, artificial neural networks have 
tremendous um, promise for understanding language. This is something that um, I would not have predicted would happen in my lifetime. Uh, but as all of you know, um, artificial intelligence has witnessed some real engineering breakthroughs in recent years. Um, and in the domain of language, we now have um, models that are extremely impressive. The most successful uh, transformer architectures like um, BERT and GPT-2 and so on can um, do things like answer questions, translate between languages, generate free form text um, uh, that is sometimes hard to distinguish from human generated uh, text. Um, importantly, we and others uh, recently showed that uh, representations that you extract from these models can accurately capture behavioral neural responses to language in humans. Um, so just to briefly highlight um, the study from our group where we did this, because I think it's one of the uh, most important pieces of work to um, come out of my lab. Um, Martin Schrimpf uh, led this effort um, with a few others. So we basically took um, 43 state-of-the-art at the time language models and compare their representations um, against representations from three human neural data sets, one from um, intracranial recordings, two from fMRI. We actually had a behavioral um, self-based reading data set as well. And the approach is very straightforward. You just take um, uh, behavioral or neural data and you feed the same linguistic stimuli for which you have those behavioral neural data and you feed them to the models. Then you extract some representations from the models from some um, critical layer, um, and then you fit a linear regression between the model representations, so sets of weights from the model, and human neural data, um, whatever they may be, voxels um, or um, electrode uh, activity. And then you see how well this regression generalizes to unseen human neural data. Um, and here's what we found. So I'm gonna plot uh, uh, normalized predictivity. So how well each model captures human neural responses. Okay, so each bar here is a model. Um, the gray line at the top is um, a normalized ceiling, uh, which is based determined by the internal reliability of the data set. So this is about as um, reliable as you can get in this um, uh, in these data. And um, different like bars that are more similar in colors are more similar uh, models. And there are two things to note here. So one is that models vary uh, quite a lot. So there is a lot of interesting variability to explore. Uh, and some models in the class of unidirectional transformers, the rightmost set of bars, already get to the estimated ceiling level. And I should say this is um, selected, this is explaining activity in the language system. So we're targeting that set of voxels or electrodes that care about language. Um, and so now I think this similarity between models and the human language system opens a lot of um, cool doors uh, because we can use these models as computationally precise hypotheses about how language is implemented in humans. And unlike the human brain, uh, these models are much easier to mess with. So we can systematically vary properties of the models, architectures, their training regimens, the kind of data they're trained on, their optimization functions, um, and so on to ask, um, what are the necessary and sufficient conditions of human-like language processing as operationalized by a good fit to human behavioral and human neural data? Um, okay, another point is that there's a long history of human elitism in science, um, but of course we share uh, large chunks of our genome and many of our perceptual motor and cognitive abilities with other animals. Uh, and much evidence now suggests that the difference between our brains and brains of other animals differ in quantitative rather than qualitative ways. And so I think we can learn a lot from probing other species um, at behavioral, neural, cellular, and genetic levels, as of course many uh, of you in the audience already do. And I think we'll hear about some of this work from uh, Tecumseh. Um, uh, so, but I hope there will be even more crosstalk between animal and human researchers uh, in the years to come. And a similar point can be made about uh, domains. Um, there's also a lot of language elitism, saying how different language is from everything else. I, I don't think it's that different. I, uh, in fact, many computations that support language uh, plausibly support information processing in other domains. And many properties of neural circuits are quite similar across the cortex. So I think um, uh, given that some domains are a little easier to probe, we can potentially make some inferences about language from those. The third point I want to make um, is that uh, the bulk of psycholinguistic, neurolinguistic, and um, cognitive neuroscience research has been done on English, German, and Dutch. 
Um, and I think some of the theorizing about language has actually been um, shaped by the properties of these languages. So for example, the rigidity of the word order in English may have led to an overly strong emphasis on the importance of ordering and sequencing in language. Um, in uh, a large uh, number of the world's languages, word order is uh, flexible. And the fact that all these uh, scientifically dominant languages have relatively complex morphosyntax um, compared to languages like, for example, uh, Riau Indonesian, studied by uh, David Gill, or emergent sign languages, I think has led to a strong focus on uh, syntactic hierarchies um, as kind of the core of what language is about. This is not a new point. Um, this point gained prominence uh, in the 90s um, in the context of research on agrammatism and aphasia when some claims made based on English simply didn't generalize to other languages and it kind of became clear that we probably don't want to theorize about language based on English um, and yet most of what we know about language processing is still very heavily biased towards a very small number of languages um, and I'd like us to work on changing that and I think we'll hear from Asfa about um, some um, exciting cross-linguistic work uh, in a couple of weeks. Um, and the final point I want to make is this. So although not universally true, in at least some ways, ontogeny probably recapitulates phylogeny. And in our understanding of language development in the brain, there is a huge gap in a very important part of the developmental timeline. So of course, behaviorally, we can study infant brains throughout their lives, um, but uh, neurally, we have some work on neural responses to speech in the first few months. Uh, of course, there's no language yet. They haven't learned any words, right? It's just responses to the acoustic properties of speech. Um, and then we have work on language uh, starting from kind of the earliest boundary right now is about three and a half or uh, four years of age, at which point the language system is basically in place and neurally it looks very adult-like in most ways. Um, and the biggest change in our language attainment, of course, happens right in between these periods. And we know hardly anything about how specialized language regions emerge. Um, and I think this can plausibly inform stories about language evolution in cool ways. Um, we're currently trying to answer some of these questions using uh, models, um, um, but of course there's limitations there as well. But luckily, there are actually really great advances happening in pediatric imaging, both on the uh, MRI technical side um, with the development of special kit coils, um, silent scanning sequences, and so on, and on the experimental side with the development of paradigms that can be engaging for kids in this um, age range. Um, Rebecca Sachs at MIT has been at the forefront of this work, um, and a student in her lab, Haley Olson, is actually starting to test toddlers uh, on language paradigms kind of as we speak. So I think exciting discoveries about how language system comes to be uh, may lay ahead in the near future. And I'm gonna stop here. Thanks for listening. Thank you so much. That was a fabulous talk. Um, so I'd like to now invite the panelists to ask any questions they have and start the discussion. I will keep an eye on the Q&A. Like I said before, if any audience members want to uh, put some questions in the Q&A, that would be great. Please upvote the ones um, that you want to hear about and I'll sort of throw them in um, where appropriate. So yeah, let's start the discussion. I think Takam's out the question. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Ev. It's always, always fun to see you uh, present and it's always convincing and uh, cogent. Um, I want to, my, my question is really a, from an evolutionary point of view and, you know, connecting to what you said at the end about animals and what they teach us and also at the beginning about, you know, what, what's the difference between us and chimpanzees. But I think a better way to get at it is to talk about music and language. So you mentioned uh, Patel's shared resources hypothesis. And my, my problem with a lot of what you said is that you, you've been discussing this language system and you, you mean this frontotemporal network that you use particular fMRI paradigms to elicit. And, and it seems to me you're treating it as kind of a thing, as if it's a reified, this network does language. And I think that within the context of these particular studies, that may be true. 
but you're not going to the deeper level that I think Patel is, is going at. Namely, how do we break that network up into different computational um, components? And I, I, you surely don't think that kind of any part of the temporal cortex or any part of the frontal cortex is doing exactly the same thing. It's not just totally distributed in that sense. So if there are special subcomponents of language, computationally defined subcomponents, for example, Patel's structure building, um, how would you even get at those using the paradigms that you're talking about? And I think this particularly becomes relevant when you start talking about domain general and you know, this, this uh, multiple demand network. Again, you're reifying a particular network and treating a whole set, a, a huge number of neurons as doing this thing, dealing with multiple demands. But that doesn't seem like a fair comparison. I mean, showing that there's not overlap between those doesn't seem like a fair approach to Patel's hypothesis at all. So it, it may be that Patel's wrong and I'm wrong about dendrophilia, but I don't think any of the data that you've shown us so far really demonstrates that. Okay, well, I'm not sure. Um... I'm not sure I agree. So <laughs> I mean, let's just like, let's just talk through this, right? So like, if you want to make a claim that um, structural processing is shared between two domains, you want to find some paradigms that find you areas um, that are, that show sensitivity to structure, right? The system that I talk about, and I should say, like, I talk about the system, but of course we always look at all the regions separately as well to make sure that there's no interesting differences emerge. Mostly they actually do show very similar profiles, but okay. So the system that I talked about as the language system, including its frontal components, but also temporal components shows very robust sensitivity to structure. It shows sensitivity to violations of structure, to structurally unexpected um, elements. It shows adaptation to structure. It responds more to structure than unstructured elements. It shows sensitivity to cost of building structures and unambiguous um, sentences. So to the extent that uh, linguistic structure building is happening in the brain, it happens within the system. Now we take another domain like music and we say, do any parts of the system that care deeply about structure building and language, do they respond when you listen to music? and they don't. To me, that's very strong evidence that that system is not, is not the same system that supports structure processing in music. But I don't think that's fair. Okay, so let's, let's take the, the music example. So, okay, inferior frontal gyrus, it tends to be more biased on the left and more biased to the right in music and language. Does that mean they're not doing the same thing? Or does that mean, as Patel suggests, that the right side is more specialized to deal with notes and chords and the right and the left side is more specialized to deal with, with word meanings. I, I, I don't um, think the argument look, you just made excludes that possibility. I'm not well, talking about whether a voxel overlaps. I'm talking about whether a computational function overlaps. And those are two different things. I'm talking about resource sharing. I'm saying, does the same bit of the brain process structure in language and music? The answer to that question is an unambiguous no. There is no bit that responds to both structure building in language and structure building in music. Now, whether there is homotopic areas that may be doing similar things across domains, I'm not talking about here today. Well, I have stuff to say about it, but I'm saying okay. that there's no resource overlap. There's no shared bit that does structure processing in language and in music. That right. just doesn't exist. And I think the data that I showed exactly addressed that question because that's why we did those. Uh, I, I, I don't think it's unambiguous, but I don't, I'm, I'm willing to cede that point. It's still the key point, and this is what I'd like you to say more about, is exactly that homotopic. Is it simply accident that, that similar regions on the right and the left side are doing similar things in music and language? It doesn't, that seems, I, I, that doesn't, that defies. Uh, I mean, that's a whole separate set of questions, like why the brains are organized the way that they are and yeah. what the homotopies reflect. But that's not the question I addressed in my talk, if you want. Like I can give a different talk on like lateralization of function and why some functions may end up in one hemisphere or the other. I'm here talking about resource sharing. And the point I made is that the system that supports structure building and language does not support structure building and music. That's all I want to say in the context of this talk and in the context of the data I presented. Um, in well, fact, there is now strong evidence of music specificity that Sam Norman Hagner discovered. And those musically selective regions are in parts of the auditory cortex, not in the frontal cortex. Anyway, we could keep talking about it, but I'll let, I'll let other people speak. Thanks for that lively interchange. Um, uh, Asipa. 
Uh, thanks, Ev. That was a wonderful talk. Great big picture summary. And and some aspects I'm extremely sympathetic that language is for communication. In others, I find myself in an agonistic relationship with you, surprisingly to me, um, about language not being involved in complex thought. So um, in uh, the Worfian literature, as it's known, there's many cases where we can see that language is playing a role either online or as part of a developmental sequence uh, when we compare across languages, for example. So if we take you know, the well-studied domain of colour, we can see that different colour lexicons seem to affect the way that people behave in non-linguistic tasks. And then if we interfere with language use online, the effects go away. And if we look at ERP data, the effects seem to show early emergence and visual cortex. And so I'm wondering how to reconcile that sort of data with the picture that you've shown today. Yeah, so there's, I guess, two parts to that question. So first, um, I'm not um, convinced by all the color data that you mentioned. I think a lot of these studies have failed replication attempts, um, including some like very well cited studies. So I think it's not that there is like unambiguous strong evidence for language affecting um, perception. Now, of course, language can help you think. And of course, language can help you do, do things, right? And we're very good at solving all sorts of tasks. So if I have a task where encoding something linguistically will help me do the task better, of course, I'm going to do it. It's a useful way to do this, right? Like it's a useful device and it will help me um, solve this task. But from my take on that literature, I don't think there are strong cases where the fundamental perception, like our representation of number or our representation of the color space is shaped by the language we speak, I, I don't take that evidence. Yeah. As, um, yeah. So I think I, I feel I feel that's um, and I from my perspective, not a fair characterization of the literature. So for the color research, when you have multiple labs, uh, so you know not just the Barditsky lab, but Terry Regeer has shown the effects, Anna Franklin, who's a skeptic, has shown effects. Um, uh, Rasha Abdul Rahman recently published something over a decade now. We're using different paradigms, finding similar effects that, um, yes, it's true that the effect is modulated by the use of language online, but we're finding a recurrent thing. And for number as well, we see, you know, the early studies with Paraha, okay, we can argue with that, but then you see it again in home signers, you see it again in the Nicaraguan sign language across generations. Um, you see it in the work with it's Mane, <laughs> having uh, count sequences uh, effects, um, just being able to represent number for these sorts of tasks. So I think um, I don't see it as being, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm surprised at your strong stance against language playing uh, a role well, I mean, in complex. Yeah, condition. I mean, strong stances make it like easier to make progress in science, right? Like we, <laughs> if we all agree then now. Um... But not if you're not not if you're not able to account for the existing data. Yeah. No, like, yeah. Um, so, so you want to be able to I wanna say that I'm not like I think in some ways the the work that I've talked about is um in some ways orthogonal, right? Because I'm not strictly saying that language cannot affect perception or cognition. What I'm saying is that absent language, it seems that most capacities develop and can function fine. So language is not a prerequisite for um, typical processing and thinking. Right, which is the evidence from, uh, for example, global aphasia. You take the language system away, and all other in, in, in a developed adult system. Right, right, and so the deaf kids' evidence is most relevant for the other stuff, like the fact that you can develop math just fine, develop causal reasoning fine without uh, linguistic input early on. Okay, but, so uh, I think then I think we disagree on our reading of the literature there because I think there are differences. But okay, I this is I, I agree with you that these are exactly the sorts of data points uh, yeah. that with that. I'd be very curious. Case. I'd be very curious to see if, other than theory of mind, um, what you think are strong cases of certain capacities not developing in a typical way absent language. I'm very interested in that. Which, please. Um, yeah. So for uh, Elizabeth Spappen has published on this, and so is um, Annie Senges and Molly Flaherty published um, uh, papers with looking at both Nicaraguan home signers and Nicaraguan signers from different cohorts, comparing their numerical cognition abilities. So those are two that come to mind immediately, but there, but there's other uh, studies too. But when I completely, I think that's important as well that we find um, yeah. what sort of evidence would we need mm -hmm. in order to be able to distinguish these yeah, accounts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks.
Yeah. Great talk. Thank you. Tommy. Hi, thank you. That was great. I enjoyed learning about all the things that you've been doing. Um, I was I was curious, I wanted to dig a little deeper into how you were defining the language areas that you were looking at. So, so you ran a localizer and in particular, the extent to which that's about external language, right? So sort of, you know, you sort of talked about it as language processing and, you know, processing sentences and so on versus the internal language that's sort of self-generated because I think that distinction might be one that's relevant to thinking about, you know, whether a task is something that requires language in some sense, in that I think it's often the kind of internal language that might be the kind of thing that we think about as being involved in some of those other cognitive processes. Um, well, I guess, so, so there's, um, I guess, a couple of things to say. So um, what you call internal language does not appear to be universal, first of all. So about 10% of people don't have an internal monologue, similar to how there is some proportion of people who don't have visual imagery. So it doesn't seem to be like a critical human prerequisite for thinking. But to the extent that you get people, for example, to um, uh, covertly generate um, linguistic productions, that engages the system as well. And to the extent that you give people tasks, which are typically associated with having an internal monologue, like Raven's matrices or solving math problems or solving kind of logical deductive um, issues. The language system is silent. So um, I think we should be careful about our introspection about how we think. Like some things may feel to us like a <laughs> kind of verbal code, but maybe they aren't. Um, but but so I'm, I mean, I'm curious if you, if you gave people tasks that were explicitly about generating internal language and use those as the basis for a regularizer, sorry, for a, as a basis for a localizer, what um, you, that would look like and whether it might correspond better to the, the, the kinds of cognitive functions that you're saying are, are not overlapping. Yeah, I mean, the system that you would get um, uh, for um, that, like a system that it does engage when we kind of just lie in the scanner kind of think to ourselves is the default network. So this is a system that is linked to all sorts of things. There is debates about the subdivisions within that system, but that is a system that I talked about as something that integrates information over long periods of time. And like I said, I think that system is the downstream uh, target of the language system when we get some approximation of meaning and then we do reasoning on those meaning. And I think that reasoning happens in part in the default network. Um, but the key thing there is that those representations no longer seem to be linguistic because that system doesn't, for example, show close tracking of the linguistic input. Uh, we're trying to figure out how to probe the representations there. Basically what seems likely to happen is that we extract meaning from some chunk of language, some span of words, and then it's converted to a more abstract conceptual representation. We discard the linguistic information. Presumably that's also done for memory reasons, right? Like it's, and there's good evidence from uh, classic studies that people actually have very poor uh, memory for the exact verbal format, right? You discard it as soon as you've got key bits of meaning on it. And um, we're thinking very hard about how to probe the reasoning stuff that happens in the default network, because I think there's a lot of interesting action um, going on there. But it's very hard to probe, just like behaviorally thinking has been very hard to study. <laughs> um, but I think there's very exciting work to be done there. But the key thing that the key point I'm making here is that the language system is relatively dumb. I don't think that's a system that does the thinking. Um, but that system provides input to systems that do the thinking. And in terms of um, modeling work, I'm hoping that with uh, people like Josh Denenbaum, we're going to start building models that have a language module, but also some um, neurosymbolic, subsymbolic representations for structured thought, and then trying to model both the linguistic processing and the downstream processes. I think there's really exciting stuff to be done there. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that's part of why I wanted to highlight that is that it seems like maybe what you're thinking of is that abstract conceptual system you know there's, there's a kind of argument that uh, that you could imagine Chomsky running which is to say well actually that's the thing that I'm interested in and that's the thing that I think of as being intrinsically about language and you're focused on this other external thing that happens you know when we communicate and that not being inconsistent with I think his sort of evolutionary story where he thinks about that being the core thing 
And then the communicative part is being an acceptation, right? Which means that it's not that it's not shaped by the function of communication. That's not that it's not subject to evolutionary forces as a consequence of that. But that, that's not the primary thing. That's the secondary thing. And the other that's thing- all is, fine. That's all fine. But then the last um, 60 or 70 years of work on syntax processing, on aphasia, all goes out the window because that's going on in the language system. But I am fine with that first thing that you said. Um, Okay, um, I think it's time to bring in a question from the audience. So I'm gonna start with the most upvoted question, which is from Tilman Gehant. So he asks, Fodor thinks that thinking happens in a language of thought and agrees with you that natural languages are for communication. Do you argue against language of thought? Well, that's very related to what Tom was just asking. Um, you know, I don't know what language of thought is. <laughs> um, you need to kind of formally define something to be able to study it. I mean, um, I think the nature of conceptual representations is one of the biggest um, and least understood things um, that, um, you know, remains in the study of um, um, human cognition. Uh, I've kind of chopped up one piece of it the language system found that thinking doesn't happen there. So, and we're, of course we'll keep doing work on the language system, but I'm now very interested in downstream thinking process, which apparently happen elsewhere. Um, and maybe through those studies, we'll eventually get a better handle on what this language of thought may be, but it's clearly like, it's it's not a, it's not in a verbal code. That's That seems clear from the evidence that's already available. Okay. Um... Another comment, but it's been uploaded, so I'll read it out and see if you have any thoughts about it uh, um, from uh, Jonas Nola. Um, just to comment to what Asifa said, beside the number example, there's also evidence that in the development of spatial cognition, lack of linguistic input in home signers leads to them performing worse on spatial, spatial, spatial tasks. So he cites a paper by Gettner et al, um, 2013. That's cool. Good to know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, uh, the next question from Mark Speedman. So um, he asks, um, the, the large neural language models that you mentioned as resembling human neural mechanisms require training on many orders of magnitude more language data than adult humans are exposed to in a lifetime, let alone a child, and seem to work by memorizing the data via up to a trillion free parameters. Does that limit their use as models of human language processing? That's the kind of question I would expect from Mark. That's good. Um, thanks, Mark. So um, it's, a, it's a fair point. Um, that said, I think um, there is still a lot of um, utility in these models. So first of all, for many aspects of language, you don't need all the training that um, engineers use because engineers are trying to do some task as well as they can. To study these, uh, to probe these models as models of human cognition, you can train them on a lot less data and still get some generalization. Key properties of language like some degree of abstraction, being able to do agreement, for example, in Jabberwocky-like sentences, um, some degree of um, uh, um, generalization uh, from um, um, un to unseen constructions, unseen um, stimuli. Um, I think there is a lot of um, useful work that should be done in trying to train these models in more uh, kid-like ways and see if that kind of training actually leads to um, a better fit to human neural brain. I have a postdoc coming in um, who um, will be working on um, trying to do that. Um, I think um, what one, th one point um, that's worth making is that um, you know, I grew up like academically, um, I grew up on claims that so many things, so many phenomena in language, you just can't learn from experience, the poverty of the um, uh, stimulus arguments and so on. Now we have these models and with enough input. And like I said, I don't think you need all the input that is used to stay, to train state of the art models, but with, you know, substantial input, you can learn all sorts of linguistic sophistication. And suddenly, uh, the same people who said, like, you can never learn X from the input, they're like, oh, sure, they can do this, but can these models do math and can they do this? And I think we should just take a moment and say, okay, these models are actually linguistically very sophisticated. They're doing things that many, many, many people have argued will not be possible um, uh, through training on linguistic input alone. Um, and I think it's not um, like another kind of big point there is that it's not like I want to take one model and say this model is like the human brain. I mean, of course, all models are wrong, but some models are more useful than others. So by looking for trends, consistent trends across many, many models and model variants, 
maybe we can learn something about what makes some models better than others. And so, for example, in the paper I mentioned, we show that uh, model performance on next word prediction is predictive of their brain scores. So how well a model does on predicting the next word um, uh, predicts how well it captures human neural responses. Now, this relationship is selective. It's not true of any language test. You can see how models perform, for example, on grammaticality judgments, and that's not at all predictive of their fit to human brain. So looking for um, consistent trends across models, I think is a very powerful approach that has revolutionized um, the neuroscience of vision in the last few years. And I'm hoping we'll um, do the same for uh, language. Thanks. Um, okay, so there's a question that's asking a bit more about um, similar developmental trajectories between language and social cognition. Could you talk about that a little bit more and maybe if you have any um, recommendations for, for particular researchers? Yeah, well, I mean, I just meant, uh, <laughs> I just meant kids become very linguistically and socially sophisticated pretty early on, which is, which I was contrasting with the executive function development, which develops way into the late teens. And of course, there's all sorts of like, cool interplay that has been shown in the um, language development literature and in the social development literature, like the fact that um, uh, the joint attention capacity seems pretty critical for to learn to start acquiring words. Um, and then learning certain kinds of words allows you to reason about mental state. So that's maybe like effects of language on, on thought, right? And that's in line with a lot of um, uh, the uh, deaf literature and um, uh, emergent sign language literature showing deficits in theory of mind. Um, in, in cases where there is um, language deprivation and not no access to a full linguistic code. So that seems um, like a strong link there. So th those are the kinds of things I had in mind. But um, um, if whoever is interested, email me. I can send some references that I have to that literature. So. Great. I think we have a, quest a live question from the room. <laughs> cool. So I'm going to invite Wait, Annie up here. Am I looking at the... Okay. Hi, nice, nice to meet you. I'm Annie. Um, I'm a PhD student here at the Sealy. And I have a question about when you were talking about, slightly related to the last question about the social cognition system. So when you were talking about that and the language system, you talked about the fact that they were closely localized and they were close to each other in the brain and this idea of them maybe developing from a sort of common proto system. Yeah. But you didn't mention that in terms of the multiple demands network and this uh, language network. So I don't, I'm not super sure about how close we're talking for that to be a viable idea. Could you talk a little bit about if you think that that idea is viable for the social cognition and the language system, but not the multiple yeah. demands and language system? Yes, Thank that's you. exactly what I meant. And sorry if um, I wasn't very clear there. So yeah, so it's not just close by, it's actually similar topography. So if you look at the language regions and the social cognitive regions, they form kind of interdigitated networks. So they're distinct, but they're right next door. In, in the frontal cortex, the language system kind of abuts the multiple demand system, but they don't, their topographies are uh, like completely distinct. So when I talk about similar regions, I mean like actually closely tracking, like for each language region, there's a nearby little social region. Um, um, and again, <laughs> share references, yeah. Okay, and one more question from the room from Simon. Hi, hi. Um, I'll wait for the camera to come. It's not going to come um, <laughs> Thanks so much. I, that was great. Um, while, I, while you were talking, I was trying to square a, couple, a few things you were saying. So you're, you're emphasizing the fact that, say, music, for example, the processing takes place elsewhere. And you are also emphasizing the importance of thinking of languages as these, uh, of the diversity of languages. But then I was struck by how you would have reacted if you'd found that different languages were processed in different places. So you also emphasized how similarly all these diverse languages were localized. And then that, that strikes me as a bit of a mystery now. So if we're saying that these localized processing mechanisms emerge, they're not innate, and um, they emerge differently for, for different, different functions. Um, why do you think that uh, language, the localization of language is so similar across such diverse uh, languages? Yeah, that's a very good question. I mean, like that's a fundamental question about why the brain organizes the way that it does. I mean, so first of all, um, like one important point to make is that 
of course, I think, you know, most people probably know that the parts of the brain that expanded in humans relative to um, chimps and other animals is the association cortex. So the association cortex is basically the cortex that's not tied up during perception and motor control. Now, this association cortex houses a few of these large scale brain networks, including the language one, the default network, which um, likely has at least two sub networks within it, and the multiple demand network, which people also argue subdivides in a few different ways. So these are all um, um, networks that support, you know, so called high level cognition. Why and how exactly they end up in similar arrangements across people is a million dollar question. <laughs> um, I was talking about the proximity of the language and social systems. And that's a kind of question that I think can be empirically asked um, in development. If we can get access to um, kids' brains between like a few months old and kind of two and a half or three or so, I think we can learn something about how that cortex organizes because that's um, like all of the other stuff is very early developing, like infants come into the world and, you know, there's some developmental trajectory to visual processing, whatever, but, but the organization of the association cortex is what um, kind of gets in place in the first couple of years of life. So I don't really have an answer to that. I mean, I can tell you that um, like I'm very interested in why language ends up on the left more consistently because we now know that the right hemisphere can support language absolutely fine, beautifully, like very, like they're great people with like really like extreme linguistic talent almost who have uh, language in the right um, hemispheres. And so there's clearly no um, um, cost to it. There's like, but something makes this um, left hemisphere better so that in most people it tends there. And you know, there are stories of course out there, but um, Frank Clyde, I think is one of the, um, um, best Clyde, Clyde Franks um, is one of the best people working on lateralization questions right now. But um, yeah, so I don't really have an answer for you, Simon, except for what seems to be the case that the language and the social systems are more topographically closer. Can I just follow up on Simon's question? So um, research from sign languages suggests that language is more bilaterally represented than for spoken languages. So given now we've got some differences between how languages are being instantiated in the brain, how should we understand that within your thinking of lang the language system? Um, I don't know. More bilateral language is pre more bilateral language processing is present in many populations. It's, pre it's present in congenitally blind people. It's present in patients with every developmental disorder that has been reported, including ones that have nothing to do with language, like um, schizophrenia, or um, which is a fundamental thought disorder, or um, epilepsy. So um, uh, what, um, uh, and at least in some cases, more bilateral language responses seem maladaptive. Um, you know, why it happens to be the case um, in sign languages, I'm not sure. You could tell a story about hand dominance, right? Where um, perhaps for sign language, um, there's less of a, a hand preference because both hands are used consistently um, and um, a lot, but um, that's all speculation. I don't really have answers, sorry. Okay, so I think that brings us to a close and I want to thank Ev so much for a wonderful talk and um, a very interesting question period. So thank you very much for that. Guys. Um, and I look forward to seeing you four here for uh, Tom's talk next Thursday. And I hope the rest of the audience comes and joins us too. And uh, thanks again for a lovely talk. Thanks for hosting. Thanks, Jenny. Okay.